Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Behind the Curtain of the Coulomb Counter for Battery State of Charge Measurement. This presentation is uh, based on some previous material, some of which you can find in my YouTube channel. These are the three uh, links here. And here is a presentation, a video by company that makes the device that I'm going to talk about. And all of these will be put in the page of this present video, the one that we are watching now. And please note that the uh, commercial device that I'm referring to in this video is just shown for educational purposes. There is no recommendation and I'm not involved in any way or affiliated with the company or manufacturer that makes this device. So what is state of charge? Well, if we have a battery and then we either uh, use it or charge it, there's a current flowing back and forth and obviously we would like to know how much energy is still in the battery. And we define or refer to the energy in terms of amp hour or milliamp hours. This is the state of charge. So a, we start with a empty sort of discharge battery, charge it, the voltage goes up, up to a certain maximum value. And this will be the 100% state of charge of the battery, depending on the battery. Now, the span here is about one volt. And the point that uh, we'll be addressing in this uh, video is how can we estimate the state of charge? One way would be to measure the voltage. But as I've said, the span is fairly small and also the voltage is a function of temperature and aging. So this is not a very good measure for the state of charge. On the other hand, there aren't other methods which are very good. And the best one that people have been using is to measure the current and sort of to accumulate or to integrate it to get the charge. So by this you can know how much charge you have withdrawn from the battery or fed to it. And so you can calculate the present state of charge. Obviously you have to have a starting point. Otherwise, if you just put a fresh battery, you don't know anything about it, then you have to use the voltage that's the best you can do and then if it hits the ends uh, you can then uh, start afresh you can sort of reset the counter and go on from there so this is the state of charge now the material i'm referring to in this uh, presentation is the application notes by dialog semiconductors regarding a coulomb counter and there is another video that explain about the same thing by the company. And this is the data sheet of this device. It's a mixed mode, analog, digital, programmable IC. And just have a look at it. We're not going to dwell into it in any way. This is just for reference uh, to understand what is the device, but we're going to talk about the method, not the particular device here. And what we see here is that, first of all, we have two MOSFETs, which, which is very nice. Uh, they have 40 milliohm um, RDS on. An analog part here, ports, uh, general purpose, analog, digital. And then we have some digital part and, of course, uh, communication. So that you can sort of, by programming it with a GUI that they supply the company, you can program it so as to interconnect whatever you want and sort of get a specific application, a specific device for your application. And this is what they are demonstrating in regard to the Coulomb counter. So here it is. This is the conventional, so to speak, way of uh, measuring state of charge, uh, measuring the current and accumulating it to get the charge. And then, obviously, by that, you know the state of charge if you know the starting point. What is proposed by the company is a configuration like this. Here are two FETs, and this is why the device is uh, recommended. And then we have here what's called a flying capacitor. And the battery is, is first of all, transferring charge to this capacitor. And then it will transfer energy to the output. 
So there is sort of a bucket brigade, as we call it. And since the transfer is done after the capacitor is reaching a certain tr threshold, so then you can tell how much charge has been stored in for each transfer. And by that, you can know how much charge has been transferred from the battery uh, to the output. So this is the idea. Now, it is argued that uh, the conventional method is, first of all, has a power loss because of the resistor. And then it needs a high sampling rate, uh, especially in cases if you have uh, sharp or short spikes of current, then in order to catch them, you have to sample at fast enough uh, sampling frequency. On the other hand, here you actually integrate the current, so if there is a spike, it will be integrated and you'll, you don't need that high rate of uh, processing here. So here what, we, what will be happening is that this switch will be on, transfer energy, and I'll show it later on in more detail. So the advantage here, the low sampling rate, and uh, also presumably a lower power loss. So to implement it, uh, measure the voltage here, the two comparators which are within this device, and then this will go to a counter, and by this you can uh, count uh, or measure the amount of charge that has been transferred or moved into the battery. So here's the device, uh, sort of a general look here. These are two transistors and in the drive and well, there's the logic. Obviously you need a communication to take the information out. This is the flying capacitor. This is for the input. In fact, there's a large capacity here. This could be a battery. And here also there will be the, a bank of capacitor for the bus of the load. So basically you have a capacitor which is moving between two voltages, you might say, transfer energy from here to here. So let's see what is really happening here. Uh, when this, this is a p-channel, so I'm showing a negative pulses to the gate. So uh, when first Q1 is turned on, and energy or charge is transferred to C1. Here, the voltage of C1 goes up. When it reaches this threshold, then it moves to the next stage in which this transistor, this is off and then this is on, and then it goes down, and when it reaches this threshold, then it reverses. So it goes back and forth. The switching frequency is not forced, but it is really uh, develop uh, per the requirement of the current. The higher the current, the higher will the switching frequency. So what is the, uh, the switching frequency here? We can tell it by the following simple expressions. Capacitance is delta Q over delta V. Delta Q is C times delta V. Therefore, the current is delta Q times frequency. And therefore, the frequency is the current times C delta V. So in this, uh, in the application though, they are showing one microfarad and the delta V is 0.2. So plug it, it in, this is the switching frequency and I'm expressing it as five hertz to microamp. This will be the switching frequency and it depends on how much current you are consuming here. They are also supplying this uh, measurement curve and uh, this is, by the way, a window of this GUI. You see that uh, the thresholds here are 2 volt and 1.8 volt, and this, that the difference is 192. This is the hysteresis, so you can program it. And looking at this uh, calibration curve, you might say, I see that the frequency 2000 is a frequency. This is microamp. This is 20,000 microamps, so 2,000 divided by 20,000, it's, uh, it's approximately, of course, it's 0.1. So we find here, in this case, 0.1 hertz per microamp, while I have calculated for a one microfarad capacitor, five hertz per microamp. This means that the capacitor is in, fe in fact larger, so therefore it accumulates more and more charge and therefore the frequency is lower and the ratio is 5 to 0.1 this is 5 and 0.1 so this is a 50 microfarad capacitor which is okay 
So this uh, drawing has to be corrected. This is not one microfarad, it's 50. But uh, it's worthwhile to point out that uh, if we are talking about a low voltage and say uh, 50 microfarad or 100 microfarad, you'd like to go to a ceramic capacitor and obviously it'll be a class two ferroelectric, something like X5R. And these are extremely sensitive to the DC bias. So if you take a four volt capacitor and the bias is two volt, uh, this is around the operating point, then it loses, well, 40% of, of its capacity. So this is something to worry about. But uh, another issue, which is perhaps more important, is that the estimate of state of charge depends on the value of the capacitance that is the initial tolerance of the capacitor as well as the changes so that uh, we see it here this the, we, this is what we are counting sort of and therefore uh, the capacitor value is important here it's directly affecting the accuracy so therefore this capacitor has to be accurate if you like to get a good estimate of the state of charge. But this is the list of our problems as you will see later on. So now I am showing a slide from the video of the company. And here again, we have Delta V. This is the threshold time capacitor is Delta Q, which is fine. They're using a capacitor of 100 microfarad, which is reasonable. And again, the threshold are just about the same. So it is calculated, the amount of charge per transfer in this delta Q is 19.6 microcoulomb. Okay. Now the battery is 100 milliamp hour. So now they take the 100 milliamp and divide it by the 19.6 uh, microcoulomb and get this 51 0 to zero counts, 51,000 counts for the full battery. But, well, you have to watch the units here. This is milliamp hour, and to be consistent, you need to, to be consistent with the SI unit, so therefore this has to be joule. Joule is amp second. So, 100 milliamp hour times 60 minute times 60 second is 36 10 to the fourth. So you have actually to multiply this number by this uh, 3600. Well, it's a mistake, mathematical mistake, but again, this is not the main problem. Let's move ahead now, looking at the losses. Basically, we have a switch capacitor converter, you might say. Well, you can we use it for different purposes, but basically we take a capacitor, charge it, and discharge it. This, that's what we do. So the current we already seen is delta V C F S, but the losses per switch is delta V square C over two. That is, if you have two capacitors with different voltages, a delta V between them, and you connect them, then you lose energy. And the energy loss is this value, while this capacitor is in fact these two in serial. This can be found very easily by uh, looking at the charge of the first capacitor, second capacitor, before connecting. And then based on the conservation of charge, you can calculate uh, the final voltage and then the energy of each one, and you come up with this, when C is in fact these in series. But since this capacitor is smaller than this and smaller than this, then when it, this is in series and this is in series, it's about this flying capacitor. So I'm assuming that this is the one. So this is the, the loss per transfer. Now the power loss is times the frequency. So I can now define a figure of merit, you might call it. Power loss over current. This is the power loss, this is from here. And this is the current, here is the current from here. Lo and behold, this is a nice uh, result, delta V over two. So whatever you do, this is the loss, it, independent of the capacitor, very interesting. Once we have this, I can sort of estimate the loss. Well, for this I need delta V at the input, and delta V at the output. 
Delta V and the input, uh, the output is the difference between the hysteresis, because we go here between the low and high sides. And so this is this point two. But here, if we feed, for example, five volt, this is the maximum value of this chip anyhow, and um, we know that we start charging when the voltage of the capacitor is 1.8. So the difference is uh, a little bit more than uh, 3 volt, uh, let's say 3 volt. So this delta V for the in is 3 volt, so altogether it's 3.2 watts per ampere. We see that it's not hot in terms of the uh, power dissipation of this device. But there is a major, major problem here. This capacitor, this flying capacitor, is being charged to a maximum of 2 volt and then it goes down to 1.8 volt. Now this capacitor is connected to the output on the second stage. So the best we can hope for is that the output voltage will be 1.8 volt because this is the voltage at the point of contact here between this capacitor and the output. In fact, it could be even lower the output because there could be a difference that is, this could be higher than this. This is 1.8 we know, but this with heavy current could be even lower. So this is about 1.8 volt, maybe lower or probably lower, no matter what you do. There's no way you can go high, higher than that because the capacitor that is feeding it is ending here at 1.8 volt. So this is in fact a voltage regulator, very poor one, that keeps the voltage about 1.8 volt. And we know that these regulators in general are very lossy efficiency is very low unless it's in what's called the target voltage a special constant ratio between input and output and here it is not so this is not what we want for the state of charge monitoring and for the coulomb counting uh, we don't want to fix the output voltage to 1.4 volt uh, 1.8 volt or even lower than that but let's have a look at the bigger picture. Here we have about 2 volts or lower. Input, well, I'm assuming 5 volt. You can assume 3 volt, whatever. So there is a voltage difference here. Current is flowing through here. So there is a power dissipation or loss of delta V times I. This is exactly like an LDO, which keeps the output approximately constant. A LDO will be better than that. And then the voltage drop on it times the current through it is the loss. So I think that this is not a state of charge circuit. It's demonstrating the use of the device, but for no use. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.